I'm Drew Stevenson. I'm a professor at South Texas College of Law in Houston, and this is a video about two new laws or statutes that we have in Texas that were passed in 2021, SB 19 and SB 13. I'm mostly focused on the first of those, which is about protecting the gun industry from banks that don't want to lend to them or bankroll them anymore. Um, the SB 13 is a companion statute that punishes banks um, in Texas if they um, adopt environmentally friendly policies or try to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Um, I think these laws are a terrible idea. I hope they get repealed um, and I'm going to explain why. But you should be aware, part of why I'm studying this and writing about it and publishing about it is that um, the Texas laws are now kind of serving as a model for similar laws being proposed in other state legislatures. And so it's possible that this will, um, type of policy will spread to other states and create a lot of problems. So let's start with a little bit of background. After the mass shootings in Parkland and Las Vegas in 2018 and 2019, some of the largest banks, um, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, and Goldman Sachs, and a few others announced plans to in varying degrees to curtail their lending to manufacturers or sellers of certain guns or to require companies to borrow money from them to restrict their sales. Now, all of these announcements were a little different. Uh, some were targeted at sales of assault rifles or sales to um, uh, buyer purchasers who are under 21 or bump stocks like the device that was used in the Las Vegas shooting. But in various ways, the biggest banks in the country said that they would like to kind of start to step away from the gun industry and uh, stop um, lending to them or reduce their financial ties to them. It's a little unclear exactly what prompted them to do this. Of course, the timing um, led a lot of uh, news coverage to conclude that this was because the managers were either doing a public relations stunt or were um, trying to uh, play their part in shaping social policy, right? So, um, and certainly the Texas legislature, it's very clear from the legislative history and the statements by different politicians in Texas that they attribute this to what they call woke um, uh, managers at the biggest banks in the country. Um, and what they mean is political views that uh, they don't agree with. Um, or idealism. It could also be a moral or conscience issue for the managers, right? So it, it, maybe they feel like they're enabling something that's causing a lot of social harm or that in some way that they're even complicit in these mass shootings because they continue to lend money to the manufacturers of military style weapons that market their weapons to, um, uh, to young people and, and so forth. Um, you should be aware that there are other factors that um, and pressure points that could be affecting the bank's decisions here. So, uh, for example, there's in the environmental space and in the gun space, there's uh, various uh, consumer groups and uh, citizen activist groups that have organized pretty impressive boycotts um, or threatened boycotts of financial institutions if they continue to bankroll the, um, the fossil fuel industry or the gun industry. And maybe these have made mo no difference or maybe they actually have an impact and persuade the managers, you know, this is uh, affecting our reputation. It's um, leading uh, people to organize boycotts and get their friends and uh, relatives and so forth to, to um, shift their resources and not patronize our banks anymore and so forth. There are also activist shareholder groups. So these are people who pool their money or raise money buy up shares of companies and it could be the companies that they're targeting themselves like the uh, like gun manufacturers and the fossil fuel companies or uh, these financial institutions and they show up at shareholder me meetings and give presentations and force things to a vote and so forth and and in that sense they are merely ex exercising their rights as partial owners of the company they own enough shares they buy up enough shares so that they can um, play a part in steering uh, company policy. 
Um, the Texas legislature also repeatedly referred to um, pressure from years ago from federal regulators um, uh, on banks to basically uh, divest from or stop lending to um, gun stores. I'm very skeptical about that. That's the subject of my third video in this series. Um, and so we'll come back to that later. Uh, you, it's also good to keep in mind that there are some very large employee pension funds. And some of these are for large nationwide unions. Some of them are for state employee unions. And these large pension funds, they have tens of billions or maybe more uh, to invest in the stock market um, to kind of grow the, the funds for the, the pensions for those employees. And they have a lot of market power and they have policies about certain industries that they won't invest in and so forth. And so it's very possible that the banks were merely responding to pressure from um, a few of the biggest pension funds, which are not the same as the banks, but because they want those pension funds business um, or uh, consumer boycotts or shareholder activists. Now let's talk about the statute itself, SB 19 in uh, Texas. It basically forbids any government entity in Texas. So that's a state agency or a municipality. And so we mean cities, towns, um, and counties from uh, contracting with banks or financial institutions, actually any company really, um, if, that, uh, if the contractor discriminates against firearm or ammunition manufacturers. Now, uh, this could apply to any co company and any contract in Texas um, from any government entity, but uh, the part that everybody's really concerned about is the underwriting for municipal bond issues. So we have a, a situation in Texas where because of some state laws, it's very difficult for if a town or a city wants to needs to build a new school or refurbish a school or put up a new um, uh, stadium or uh, athletic field or um, overhaul their water treatment plant, any type of sort of infrastructure uh, investment like that, build a new park, um, that um, they're, they're not able to raise property taxes uh, to fund that. So they're more likely to rely on a bond, bond issue. And if you're going to do a bond issue, you need a big bank that can underwrite that bond issue. I'm not going to bore you with the details of how municipal bonds work or how the markets work for them, except that you should know there's a lot of money, a lot, a lot, billions and billions of dollars involved. And it's one of the main ways that um, cities and towns in the United States and counties are able to fund their operations and especially capital projects. Um, now, let's talk about the uh, companion statute for just a moment. This is SB 13, um, and it imposes similar restrictions on banks divesting from fossil fuel industries. So, uh, and we call this ESG in the movement. It's a much bigger deal uh, worldwide, really, um, than uh, the boycotts of the gun industry. So this is um, the E stands for environmentally friendly policies, S is social governance. So this is talking about the social impact, which could include gun violence, um, but it, it's also other types of social impacts of a company's policies. And then G is basically ethics in governance. And so this is a very, very big movement in the finance industry is this ESG movement to um, for investors who care and are, care about our society to um, shift the, the flow of money towards things that are good and away from things that are socially harmful. Now, both of these statutes, the way they operate is they require a company that wants to get a government contract, like to underwrite a bond issue, to file a certification of compliance. And, um, and now these were enacted together, they're codified together, and the certification process basically pairs these two statutes, SB 19 and SB 13. So a bank will file an official document with the state saying we hereby certify that we are in compliance with SB 19 and SB 13, that we don't discriminate against um, any uh, one in the gun industry or anyone in the fossil fuel industry. And if they don't certify their compliance, they are debarred from getting any contracts in the state. 
Now, there are some other things going on here that you should be aware of. So Texas, as I said, adopted and codified SB 13 and 19 together. And the climate impact or ESG movement is really bigger and more worldwide than the anti-gun movement. So people concerned about um, climate change in the United States or Canada or Australia or Western Europe um, are, are increasingly pressuring financial institutions um, to, uh, to basically stop bankrolling the fossil fuel industry. And so this is a large uh, thing where investors will prefer to invest only in companies that have adopted ESG policies. We have a new regulation proposed by the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States that will require standardized ESG disclosures. I'm a fan of this rule, but you should be aware it's very controversial. The rule does not forbid company, uh, let's say banks or other companies from having um, uh, uh, environmentally, like from polluting or having unfriendly to the environment policies. It just requires that all the disclosures are um, uh, the same so that investors can get accurate information. Co any company can just claim, oh, we're a green company or we're environmentally friendly and we have an, we're very concerned about the environment. And the, the, the SEC is going to require companies to follow a standard um, method for calculating their carbon footprint and um, the carbon um, contributions of their vendors and suppliers and so forth. Um, the, the EU is doing similar things to this through um, treaties like the Basel III Accords, which um, require standardized disclosures and encourage um, companies basically to reduce their carbon uh, footprint and be more environmentally friendly. So let's talk about the effects of uh, SB 19 and SB 13 so far in Texas. Remember, this was passed only about a year ago. Um, and I'm going to focus on Citigroup in particular. So um, when Texas passed, the Texas legislature passed the statute with, you know, great fanfare and soaring political rhetoric. Um, the, the biggest banks who were the targets of this basically said, we're not going to change, right? We're not going to let one state dictate the policies of our, our bank nationwide or worldwide. We're, these are huge banks. So they said, we, we can't, we're not going to let one state force us to lend money to gun manufacturers just because they like them politically or something like that. So the, several of the banks like Bank of America and JP Morgan just called it quits and packed up and withdrew from the Texas um, bond market and said, we actually don't even need the Texas bond market. Um, Citigroup initially indicated that, that they weren't going to change anything, but then after a few months, they filed a certificate of compliance saying we are actually in compliance with SB 19 and SB 13. We're not boycotting the fossil fuel industry or the gun industry, but they didn't change their policies about guns. And so um, they uh, secured several contracts with towns and, and counties and other government entities in the last year um, to underwrite bond issues or very lucrative contracts because they had certified compliance. Well, the the gun industry, the gun lobby has complained about this and said, you're you're filing a certification of compliance, but you're still discriminating against us. So in January of 2022, the National Shooting Sports Foundation or the NSSF, that's the official lobby group um, for uh, gun companies, filed formal complaints with um, the state of Texas um, saying that Citigroup is still discriminating against them because they are boycotting bump stock sellers. Now, keep in mind that it's currently illegal to sell bump stocks in the United States because of a federal regulation. Um, that regulation, though, is being challenged in the courts and the challenges are pending before the U.S. Supreme Court right now when I'm making this video. So it's possible that the regulations will be overturned, but it's currently illegal to um, uh, buy and sell bump stocks in the United States. And they are, um, uh, there's some other policies that Citigroup has. So they're saying that the um, a certification of compliance is bogus. Attorney General Ken Paxton, who is a self-proclaimed opponent of ESG policies and a friend of the gun industry, um, has declared that um, city's status is still under review, but hasn't made any type of final decision.
So for example, as an illustration of the confusion this is creating, I'm recording this video on September 24th um, of 2022, and just in uh, recent days on September 16th, a town in Texas, Anna, Texas, which is in North Texas, um, it was put out a, a bid for uh, held a, a an auction basically a bidding process for a, a very large um, bond issue that they want to do for a hundred million dollars Citigroup offered the best bid the cheapest one the one that would save that do the most for the town for the least amount of money and the town declined their bid and went to the second best bid or the runner up, which was Baird. This is going to cost the town hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next few years. And so from uh, the standpoint of free market economics, um, SB 19 and SB 13 are not free market um, uh, proposals. They are interfering in the free market and eliminating competition and in fact eliminating the biggest players in the industry so there's a lot less competition and when there's a lot less competition there's going to be price increases and that's exactly um, what we're starting to see so even though Citigroup is getting some towns to do contracts with them because they have filed a certificate of compliance um, it, it, Anna Texas basically said we're not sure what your legal status is in the state so we're not going to give you the the bond I issue uh, contract even though you ha gave us the best bid um, now this has been studied by a couple of economists and so uh, Garrett and Ivanov published a study in July of 2022 that basically said these two statutes together led to the exit of four or five of the largest municipal bond underwriters from the state and so they asked, what does this cost the state? Well, it, Texas governmental entities are going to pay an additional 300 to 532 million in interest on the $32 billion in bond borrowing just from the first eight months after this was um, enacted, right? Uh, these laws were enacted. Bonds, we're talking about uh, huge amounts of money here. You don't have to worry about the specific figures, but the question is, um, if you want to punish a bank that, uh, or any bank that uh, doesn't like the gun industry or won't lend money to, on principle to the gun industry, and the question is, what it, what's it worth to you? Is it worth costing your, the taxpayers in your state um, half a billion dollars, right? Um, $500 million um, a year, let's say. Um, it, so this is very expensive. There's less competition. Um, the biggest banks get economies of scale. They're able to find larger purchasers of um, bond issues. Uh, um, and so the, what's happening is the municipalities that can't use them are having to do smaller um, bond issues or the banks that underwrite it are having to do um, a, a larger number of smaller transactions and that raises costs. Uh, for the underwriter and the towns. Um, the municipalities, as you would expect, that were the most dependent on the banks that are now banned um, for bond underwriting have had the highest increases in their borrowing costs due to these new laws. Now, I want to return to the point about the activist shareholders because there's been some news coverage of that um, recently too. The uh, recently formed a consortium of 14 religious shareholders that are called the Northwest Coalition for um, a responsible investment. Um, so this is a group of basically nuns and bishops and um, uh, churches are have been buying shares in Smith and Wesson to try to force the adoption of violence prevention policies. This was covered in the September 10th uh, um, issue of Time magazine. Um, the NCRI is an offshoot of a longstanding interfaith coalition for corporate responsibility that's been around since the 70s, and that's a mix of faith-based and ethics-based investors who together have about $4 trillion in managed assets, and they are able to buy enough shares to be um, a leading shareholder and then force uh, corporations to change some of their policies and practices basically for the betterment of society. And so um, this is something that's going on in the background. Te Texas can pass whatever laws it wants, but there are um, shareholder groups that can pool their assets and have a lot of assets that can end up buying shares of a bank. If I could put this on the sort of lower level, if you don't want a gun shop 
um, in your town and you have a lot of money, you can just buy the gun shop, buy out the gun, uh, the owner of it, and then close the store, right? If you want, and that's, it's your money. If you want to go around buying up gun stores and then closing them down and turning them into nail salons or restaurants or something like that, that's your business. It's a free country. Well, it's not as free in Texas anymore because of uh, this law. Okay, it's a little unclear in the long term what the effects are going to be. It's not clear at all that the largest banks are going to change their policies eventually um, under pressure from Texas, um, that the Texas laws will force them uh, to do this, or even if a few other states join Texas. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. It's also unclear whether the banks will find some way to certify compliance without changing their policies um, by uh, finding, um, uh, availing themselves of exceptions in the statute or technical technicalities and loopholes and so forth. So it, the statute is new. It's not that well drafted. It wasn't drafted very well. And so it is possible that over time, the banks will bas basically be able to find some legal workarounds and start um, uh, underwriting bonds again in spite of the statute and be able to certify compliance. Um, it's not completely clear under the statute if it applies across affiliates. So you get a group like Citigroup and they have numerous companies that are legally distinct corporations that are under different charters from different federal regulators. Um, and um, now they've their gun policies, it seems like apply across affiliates. So the presumption has been, I think everybody's been assuming that these statutes, SB 13 and 19, also apply across affiliates. I think the, stat the statute says a company, and it doesn't really address the problem of subsidiaries or umbrella corporations and so forth. So there's some uncertainty about that, I think. Now, there's a related area of litigation. This, these two statutes I've been talking about, SB 13 and SB 19, haven't really been litigated yet. Um, but as if you're a lawyer or a law student watching this video, you might imagine that there would be a First Amendment challenge uh, brought to these. And so I want to talk about uh, some similar statutes. These are the anti-BDS statutes. So um, there's a, a movement called BDS, which means Boycott, Divest, and Sanction, which is focused on um, Israel and its treatment of Palestinians in the occupied territories. And so... A few states, including Texas and Arkansas, have laws very similar to the ones I've been talking about that basically punish companies that, um, that boycott the nation of Israel. And this summer, in June, the Eighth Circuit upheld one of these statutes and basically said that corporations do not have free speech rights to do boycotts, to um, refuse to deal um, with certain customers like the nation of Israel or Israeli companies or something like that. Um, you should be aware that there are lower court cases that have gone the other way and a number of law professors filed um, an amicus brief um, before the Eighth Circuit arguing that the statute should be struck down, that it's unconstitutional and um, violates uh, the First Amendment right to free speech. We have some similar litigation going on in Texas. So one of the cases is Amawi v. Paxton, um, and this was also a challenge by an individual to the Texas anti-BDS statute. Um, after the case uh, went through the trial court and started working its way up on appeal, Texas amended the statute so that like SB 13 and 19, it applies only to companies. So when it got to the Fifth Circuit a couple of weeks ago um, in September, early September, they basically said the case is moot and the motion before the issue before the Fifth Circuit was whether attorney's fees were still um, due. The live case in this area is a &R Engineering and Testing versus the city of Houston, um, which was decided in January. And um, there, the um, Judge Hainan in the Southern District 
um, basically uh, decided not to rule on the legality of the statute, but decided that it couldn't apply to the um, challengers in this case. In other words, they were allowed to continue their boycott and get a contract with the city of Houston. Um, and basically, he narrowed his holding just to the very specific facts of, um, uh, of the case and the parties involved and declined to reach the issue of the um, constitutional, uh, constitutionality of the statute in general. Why am I talking about this? Well, in theory, if the Texas's uh, um, statute against boycotting Israel were held to be unconstitutional, um, then SB 19 and SB 13 would also probably be unconstitutional because they interfere with the free speech rights of these corporations, namely the banks. On the other hand, at least one circuit, the Eighth Circuit, has already gone the other way, upholding that. Now, there are some differences, right? And so it's possible to say, well, the, the, this, the laws about Israel and policies about boycotting Israel are a little more complicated legally because it touches on um, United States foreign policy and uh, treaties that we have to comply with, with our allies. There's a federal statute that forbids anyone in the U.S. from participating in uh, any company, at least, um, in the Arab League's um, uh, embargo of Israel uh, back in the 70s. It's an older statute. And so um, the, the legal status for boycotting a foreign nation is a little different and a little more complicated than um, boycotting a particular um, entity or industry in the United States. So it's possible to uh, draw some distinctions between these anti-BDS statutes and the cases around them and SB 19 and SB 13. But there's clearly some overlap. And so if eventually the Supreme Court um, says that states can have anti-boycott laws like this, um, it, we, I would expect that to be applied to uphold SB 13 and SB 19. And if it's held that corporations have a free speech right to engage in a boycott, then presumably it would invalidate uh, these statutes as well. And that concludes my first video about SB 19 and SB 13. There are two more videos. Um, one where I'm going to talk about, compare it or put it in context, these laws uh, for what's going on in other states and with the federal government. And in my third video, I'm going to talk about something called Operation Choke Point.